Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about generators in a variety of languages, both stackless and stackful in their coroutines. I'm going to start with C20, and for more details, you can refer to my video last week. And as a recap of what I was doing there, I have a data set called cities500.txt, which comes from the GeoNames website. And I can take a look at what it looks like. It's 30 megabytes in size and has about 194,000 lines in it. So it's a little bit big, but not gigantic. And it contains a list of cities in the world that have at least 500 inhabitants in them. So what I'm doing over here is I'm looping across all the rows in the file, which are tab separated values. And I'm getting the latitude out and the population out and keeping a total population as well as keeping a population of those who are in the Southern Hemisphere and then reporting out whatever I find. And if I do this in C++, I see that I'm taking over 100 megabytes of RAM if I preload them all. So what implementation does here in the preload version is it puts every single row into a vector where each row is a vector of strings, which are the fields in that row. And if I want to be more efficient, I can swap out this preload version for one that instead reads as we go and uses this co-yield feature of C20 to make it feel like I have my own stack when I really don't. It's really wrapped up in this generator, which is stored on the stack inside of main. But it allows me to pretend I have control here, and I can yield things repeatedly from my loop here and read them as an iterator here in my main function. And if I do this version of my C++, I find that it uses less than two megs of RAM and also seems to run faster. So let's move from C++ to Go. And unlike C++ 20, Go has stack full coroutines and is probably the most popular language that features this prominently in the language. So a stack full coroutine might also be called a fiber. And basically each uh, Go routine, as they call them in Go, has its own stack and the Go runtime is swap between them. But before we look at Go routines, let's look at an example of preloading in advance, just like before. So here's preloading in advance where I read all into an array of array of strings. Then I can loop across them, parse out my latitude and population, and then do my calculations as before. If we run it, we see that it takes over 100 megabytes, just like the preloaded version of C++. And it may be worth running it multiple times. Notice my second run is somewhat faster here. And make sure you keep that in mind when you're checking your performance speed. But we do see over 100 megabytes of memory usage. Let's swap this out for one that uses Go routines and see how that compares. Now the way Go routines work in Go is you go your routine and you give it a channel so you can communicate back and forth. And my Go routine over here, instead of reading all at once, it is instead going to read one at a time, end on, end of file. If there's an error, it gives the error. And if there's not, it gives the row. And because of how range-based for loops work in Go, I can't just easily swap out one for the other like we could in C++. If we look over here, also we note that instead of a generic like iterator protocol or interface in Go, you can explicitly use range-based for loops on arrays, pointer to arrays, slice, string, map, or channel, where channel acts differently than the others. So let's comment out the previous implementation that used the array and instead use a channel-based version. So here's what my new for loop looks like, and I'm going to be checking my errors as I go instead of after the loading is finished before the loop started like I had before. And if I run this version, I see that it now takes less than eight megabytes and possibly runs faster than before as well. So that's our Go example. Let's move on to Ruby, which like Go has stacked full coroutines or fibers, but it behaves a little bit differently. So we get an interesting contrast. Here's our basic version here. We're going to read our rows and we're going to yield our split lines, just like before, but we're not actually using coroutines yet. And this has to do with the block feature of Ruby. Here's our calculations. We're looping over our rows and we're parsing things out, calculating and reporting as before. But the difference is there's a hidden extra parameter going into this read rows function, which is this anonymous function here. So whenever it's saying yield, it's really just doing a callback into this function, which means I don't really have an iterator or they call them enumerator in Ruby that I can pass around from place to place. It's instead just a callback. And we're gonna investigate a little bit deeper into this. 
Well, let's first run our program. And we see that it takes 12 megs of RAM, so we know what we haven't preloaded everything in advance. It was a little bit slower than we saw before, which is what we expect from an interpreted language. But let's go and see what we can do about making something that's actually a generator instead of a callback, which has, again, the limitation of being restricted to a single block. Let's comment out our main code here and investigate a little bit of how these loops and enumerators work in Ruby. So if we run this version of the program here, we see the number one. This is a callback being passed to the each method, and it ends the callback early when it sees break. That's what's happening here. Alternatively, we can call each without a block, and it gives us an enumerator that we can call next on as many times as we want to, or pass this enumerator around wherever we want to go with it. And it behaves the same as before. Notice we're all using about 12 megabytes, which is mostly just the overhead of the Ruby runtime. Let's look at this a little bit over here and how that relates to reading files. So let's open our file again. But instead of our main calculations, let's just look at one row. And let's use an explicit fiber here. If I say fiber.new and fiber.yield, instead of yielding to my callback block, I'm going to create a fiber with its own fixed small stack size. And then I can pass it around and call resume on this fiber. If I run this, I do get the information for my first row and this works as expected. Now the thing is that resume isn't the right interface to use for doing looping inside of Ruby. It's not the enumerator that we expect to see. However, there's a convenience that we have in Ruby that lets us convert a callback based function into an enumerator automatically. And this is implemented over here in the Ruby runtime in C that uses fibers to get the job done behind the scenes. So we can say here, if I'm not given a block, and I'm going to return an enumerator version of this function instead of using the block, which I don't have at this point. And then instead of using this fiber interface, I'm going to have an enumerator interface because that's what tuenum gives me. If I run this, it behaves the same as before, only now I have an automatically converted callback version into an enumerator version using fibers without having to do that manually. So if I come back to my main calculations, and instead of looping directly, store it into a variable, which now is going to do the tuenum on it. I should see the same behavior I had before, which was about 12 megabytes of RAM usage and the correct calculations for the population. And furthermore, because now I have this as an object that I can pass around, I can do things like split it up into multiple loops. So for example, I can, instead of looping immediately, I can store a function in my variable tally so I can reuse it multiple times later. And I can loop over the first billion and break when I get there, tell everybody, hey, I got a billion people now, and then continue in another loop later. Or alternatively, I could have passed this enumerator around wherever I wanted to. If I run it, I see I reached a billion, and then I finish my loop and I get the same results as before. So that's a little bit of a difference of feel and flavor between Ruby and Go. Now I want to move on to Rust, which like C++20 has stack less coroutines as opposed to stack full coroutines. But the thing is that while they stabilized async await for asynchronous task execution last fall in Rust, they have not stabilized yield for generator features. Under the covers, that's how async await is implemented, but they have not stabilized how they want to present it to the language. However, we have this convenient third-party crate called gen awaiter that uses async await to implement generators. And it will look a lot like what we had before. We can read our rows and we can parse stuff out of them and make our calculations and print them out. And here's what our generator looks like using generator. I have macros gen and yield in order to say for each of my lines, if it's a good line, split it up and yield it. Otherwise, yield the error. And this makes me feel like I had control of the stack, even though really the state of this generator is being imported into and managed inside of my main function where it's being used. So if I run this, I see that I'm using less than two megs of RAM, just like in C++20, and it runs maybe about the same speed as well. So there's a quick taste of how you can accomplish getting generators done in Rust today. And before I'm done, I want to move on to Python. And I want to show Python because it's an example of when you might not want to use generators depending on your task needs. So Python, just like Rust and C++20, has stackless coroutines, and it has this nice yield thing here. 
and I can loop over whatever I've yielded. And I can do my calculations just as before. The question is, how efficient is this to do in an interpreted language like Ruby or Python? And if I run this, I see that I'm using about 12 megs of RAM, just like in Ruby, overhead of the interpreter. And it runs relatively efficiently, but not as efficient as native code. So I'm going to run this using native code underneath via the pandas library. And in order to make it easier to compare the performance of these two functions, I'm going to import pandas in advance either way so I can amortize the cost. In a real large application, you might have various libraries all loaded up in advance and they don't affect the downstream running of the application. So I'm going to pay that cost up front here as well. If I run my generator again, I see that now I'm using 60 megs of RAM because pandas has a cost. I also see it's taking longer time because pandas has a time cost as well in order to be imported. Now let's compare this with using pandas directly though. And I have a convenience here where I make it so I'm going to call the pandas version if I pass in a different command line argument. And the pandas version is taking more memory but running faster than the generator version. Let's see what pandas is doing. In the pandas version, we're using its built-in CSV reader in order to read the library. Notice I'm only reading out the two fields I care about. So because of that, I'm actually using less RAM than the naive implementation of preloading that I had in C++ or Go. And then I'm using pandas query and statistics operations in order to calculate my results, which really behind the scenes is not calculating in Python, but really being passed down to the C libraries of pandas and NumPy in order to do the calculations in native code instead of at the Python level. And just to emphasize that this indeed is making a difference in performance, let's do some timing inside of IPython. And worth pointing out here, I've not run profiling, nor have I separated out the loading from the parsing from the calculation. So we're not sure which of these is causing the difference in time, but there is a difference. I'll load up my functions. Then I can use this handy time it feature that's built into IPython to see how long this is taking me to run these functions. So I'm taking, seems like over 300 milliseconds per call to my generator based version. Whereas my pandas based version is taking less than 200 milliseconds to do the same operation. So this is an example of where maybe I use less RAM with my generator in Python, but because I'm using Python instead of lower level native primitives, it won't execute as fast. So this is an issue you need to keep in mind depending on your language and depending on your task needs. Anyway, I hope this has been useful and fun, and maybe we can talk more about coroutines in the future. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye, y'all.